Welcome back to theCUBE's coverage of ISC High Performance 2023, where we're covering all things HPC. We're talking machine learning, AI, high performance analytics. We, we got sessions on sustainability, a little bit of quantum, and one of our favorite topics, how the storage landscape in HPC is changing. With me are Anthony Dina, who's the global field CTO for Unstructured Data Solutions at Dell Technologies, and Shervin Samak, who is the HPC product manager at Dell. Guys, welcome. Good to have you on theCUBE. Thank you for Thank having me. Thank you so much. Yeah. Shervin, maybe you could start us off. I mean, storage has gone from spinning mechanical rust in the 2010s to, I we said, finally, you got machine speeds with flash, but how specifically is high performance storage in the 2020s different from what it looked like in the 2010s? Sure, yeah. So, um, we are seeing different requirements and this requirement kind of enforced by the customer and, and their workload. Back in 2010, it was mostly HPC, uh, lots of uh, sequential IO, and now we are seeing the convergence of AI into HPC and that brings more challenge. And the challenge uh, going to be uh, more IOPS, uh, highest throughputs for the uh, performance storage. Uh, that being said, it uh, brings more flash to storage. Back in 2010, again, it was based on spindles. We are seeing a lot of more flash, specifically on NVMe, uh, blended into HPC storage. That's the uh, one of the changes we have seen in the past 10, 15 years. Uh, the other thing is uh, the introduction of cloud. So uh, data protection is important um, and we are not seeing only the deployment of data uh, just on-prem, but rather in a colo as well as public cloud. So uh, a lot of uh, objective storage also introduced in this uh, storage as well. So that's another uh, thing we see that is not, uh, we didn't see back in 2010, so. So that's Excuse interesting. Me. I'm going to, I want to ask you guys later on, we'll, we'll, I want to ask you about the sort of changing storage hierarchy, but a lot more diversity is, is what I'm hearing. Um, so Anthony, I wonder if you could comment, think about large scale HPC, been dominated by parallel file systems. I remember listening to way back in the early supercomputer days, you know, how you can share data across multiple network nodes in, in parallel. So it's perfect for data intensive workloads like now AI, especially for tightly coupled systems. My question is, do you see parallel file systems sort of maintaining their prominence and dominance in HPC in the future? Well, it's funny. I mean, there's so much work that's happening with scale out NAS uh, for embarrassingly parallel applications. It's the MPI uh, applications where we typically see the folding of physics or space, where that many to one write to a single file or a file that extends beyond a cache tier where parallel file systems become interest. But what's interesting, as we look at the workflow, uh, for example, in, in the research community around healthcare life sciences, the workflow as the data originates through an uh, NFS uh, right to a shared storage system will eventually get analyzed. Moving it into the HPC cluster, the result sets return back to the same folder so that the scientists can focus on the science. And so it's really part of a continuous loop and I think that's what's changing. So even though Parallel File Systems gets all of the shiny lights at, the, uh, at a lot of these conferences, the real workhorse in many of the enterprise applications is not. So, okay, so is the implication on that, if I could just follow up, is that a benefit to, to workflow? Is it, is it cost? Does it just mean you could do more work with, with, with less? It's uh, about continuous operation. So instead of creating uh, data, moving it into the cluster and then bringing it back, uh, job schedulers that can move those uh, relevant data sets back into a place where it gets the intensive computational analysis and then returned is what we're talking about. So it's a workflow optimization uh, more than anything else. But yeah. that doesn't mean that parallel file systems are, are fading. In fact, as particularly as we look for these AI intensive throughput oriented uh, workflows, it's still very, very relevant. Mm, interesting, thank you. Shervin, I love talking about HPC because there's so many technology advancements in the space. I mean, obviously, you know, the processor technology has been so much you know, focused on and, and, and is diversifying, but 
you got improvements. We were just talking about parallel models. You got faster interconnects, optical, AI. You got to throw quantum in there into the mix, et cetera. From your point of view, what, what are the technologies that are sort of changing the game in these high performance file systems that have the, the greatest impact on, on performance and, and, and outcomes? Sure, so we can talk about it in maybe two different areas. One in, uh, is on the hardware and the other one is basically on the software side of it, the standard protocol that has been introduced. On the hardware side, uh, we saw the introduction of PCIe and that kind of revolutionized uh, storage specifically. Uh, the other one was NVMe. So NVMe started to come in, in around like 2011. And in the past uh, almost 15, 14 years, we see uh, the throughput with the NVMe has been gone up uh, twice, uh, actually quadruple uh, 4X. So that's the hardware side of it. But when uh, we come to the software side, we see uh, different uh, introduction of CXL, uh, very important. We are going to see a lot more about it in the next coming years. Uh, RDMA over Converge Ethernet. So it's helping uh, storage as well. And I forgot one point about hardware and that's uh, 3D NAND. So like NVMe came in and then we see the QLC and TLC coming in to kind of bring down the price of the NVMe. These are kind of the uh, advantages that we have seen in the past few years that we didn't have it in, back in 2010. Just to follow up on that, Sherman, if I could, yeah. it, it seems to me that you know, applications in the 2010s were, were written assuming you had you know, a slow spinning you know, IO. Uh, so I could go off and do other things waiting for that. And now you're talking about PCIe, NVMe, 3D NAND, you know, flash, where you could do atomic writes, you're not having to wait for chatty protocols. How has that affected the software layer and the way in which people think about writing apps? So that's uh, that's where like the uh, file system is going to become very important. Like uh, it's uh, actually different level of file. Uh, so we have the file system and on top of that, we have the application. Think about it, maybe TensorFlow, Partridge at, at that level, they have to interact with the file system. So. We are seeing uh, a lot of those applications are going to be tuned and optimized to interact with the file system. That's one of the areas. But we're also seeing a lot more uh, maybe uh, features and maybe updates coming into the file system to, uh, to take advantage of the uh, high throughput media like the NVMe. So two areas, application side, as well as the file system. Yeah, got it. Uh, Anthony, I want to come back and follow up on the parallel file systems conversation we're having and maybe talk about other possible alternatives. I mean, you hear about things like, you know, you read about neuromorphic computing, you know, quantum's in there. I've read about DNA computing and I've even read about this thing called approximate computing. I mean, I love back and napkin math, so it sounds appealing to me, unless it's like, you know, designing a safety tolerance of an elevator or a thousand other things. But at any rate, are there alternatives to, to parallel file systems emerging? And if so, you know, where are they gaining traction? Is it in simulation? Is AI changing things? Where is the potential if it even exists? Well, look, uh, ultimately we're talking about maximizing someone's budget to getting the outcomes that they need through throughput capacity and uh, available storage. And whether it's by design, whether it's because the hyperscale cloud providers have offered a new kind of throughput capabilities in their cloud, we see object uh, more and more as a part of the over, excuse me, overarching ecosystem. So it's less of a replacement and more of an augmentation, but here is where we see the mullet opportunity. So instead of creating a large flat, fast and cheap uh, scratch space, why not have your parallel file system do what it does best, and that is render the writes and have fast reads at a cached or NVMe tier. And in the back, you can create a large S3 compatible repository. And so we look at collapsing the three or four tiers between the scratch, the home directories and the archive to maybe just two. 
so that you have all the performance writing on NVMe, and then you treat the back end as a persistent and archival tier in one element. Are, are you saying you're using the object as a sort of a cheap and deep get put simplification tier, or are you, are, are you, am I understanding that right? And you've got, you know, higher level look, sort of cash. Yeah, I mean, look, object has made a name for itself and its ability to find small number of files very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. It's associated with inexpensive, but what we've seen with all flash object and other increased use cases on uh, cloud native applications, it's actually become a primary data store for many different applications. And so you can find that object could be of interest outside of an HPC and having a single repository in which you can interrogate makes life a ton easier. Yeah, interesting. Definitely simplification move there. Okay, uh, Sherbin, so let's talk about a little bit about the hierarchy. So you, we always, there's a lot of talk about in-memory computing. We're always going to have a storage hierarchy. We were just talking about it collapsing a little bit. What's your view of what the storage hierarchy is going to look like within large scale HPC? Will it, will it collapse? Will it become more granular with you know, non-volatile buffers in between memory and other storage layers? You know, whether it's primary, we talked about deep archive, remote vaults, the cloud. You know, maybe I just answered my question. Is it, is it getting simpler or more granular? Paint a picture for us. Um, I think it's going to stay the same, actually, the same level of tiers that we kind of defined in the storage. Uh, it's going to be there. Maybe like the share of each one uh, goes toward the other. Uh, but uh, in, in reality, just because of the, uh, the dollar to terabyte or uh, different feature of uh, each uh, storage tier, I think we are going to see uh, different levels or tiers of a storage uh, stay. So, so parallel file system, as we talked about it, it's going to be there. Uh, scale out NAS that uh, provides the data protection, auditing some of those feature, it's going to be there as well as uh, whatever goes to the cloud. So I think it really depends on what customer really wants and depends on uh, some of the requirement, either it's the price, either it's some of the functionality, data management, everyone is going to pick and choose and create a solution around uh, what to kind of address their problem, so. And I would add on top of that, honestly, uh, you know, the, the, the linchpin in the conversation isn't necessarily the throughput as much as it's the data management, knowing exactly what you have, feeding these exabyte scale requirements um, implies a level of control of being able to move those assets around. And so data management is going to be a very interesting function that uh, may have been a little bit of lower priority. Follow up on that. Is, you talk, when you say data management, you mean sort of knowing where stuff is and being able to put it on the right tier or, or, or is it more uh, 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 data coherence? Uh, what's, the, what's, what's the outcome of better data management? Well, certainly the cost to serve and be able to move it in the right place and location, but it's even as simple as what was the result sets from the study I ran? Uh, when did I run it? Uh, who owns it? Just the findability and asset tagging or metadata tagging is really important. And that will become increasingly important as the volume increases. Got it. Um, so I was having a conversation the other day with somebody and we were talking about, okay, what's the right mix for HPC? Should it be on-prem? Should you, you the cloud guys are doing their thing? And, you know, as always, it's, and it's, and it's the, it depends if you're doing, you know, experimentation, something quick in the cloud makes sense to rent. The other, the other factor was, hey, if, if you want to show off, you know, university and your high performance computing center, obviously it makes sense to have your own, your own data center. There's like, hey, if you're going to be 50,000 cores, you want, you want to have you know that to be sort of a, a an on-prem cluster, but but what does the hybrid multi-cloud HPC storage architecture look like? And not not just the HPC storage architecture within the system, but you know within a customer's data center, across that customer's data center, out to any systems where their data resides, colos, clouds. Um, what do you guys think about that? I think. Uh... That data movement piece that uh, Anthony was talking about is to become, again, uh, the most important uh, item here, even for the cloud hybrid uh, environment, whatever it is. So because uh, at the end of the day, customers wanted to have data somewhere if they are 
putting it somewhere else, there needs to be some SaaS layer that take care of the data management for them. So, or if they have like uh, other researchers or other maybe entity in the same organization wanted to access that data, uh, how are we uh, doing this data movement? So then it becomes the issue of the collaboration and then again, come back to the data management. That's, uh, that's my take on uh, this overall hybrid plot on-prem plus colo. Thoughts on that, Anthony? Uh, uh, for me, it's all about the, and I'm going to use the word loosely, business demands. So look, if you have, if you've spent your money, but an urgent project needs to get run, you are likely to go to the quote unquote spot market and use cloud resources to get that job done, even though it may be a more expensive value proposition, time to results matter. So that's one attribute. The second is, look, even some of the best institutions with the, with the greatest uh, uh, scientists uh, resident can run out of capacity. And so we're seeing increased levels of collaboration across the university space, which then implies uh, some kind of geo-distributed way of, dis of allowing that information. In fact, it's not just data that's being generated inside of those institutions that matter. It's, it's publicly available information. So the multi-cloud hybrid cloud function is an important attribute to think about what is the data flow between the owners and how can the underlying architecture uh, support those outcomes? Uh, I'm envisioning a supercomputer super cloud. <laughs> so kind of, <laughs> yes. uh, guys, really compelling discussion. I mean, as always on this, this great topic, I really appreciate your insights today. Thank, thank you very much. You're welcome. And thank you for watching our continuous coverage of ISC 23 and the innovations in high performance computing. You're watching theCUBE, your leader in enterprise and emerging tech coverage.